away, friends. It's me, Dave Landau. After a long night on stage, I like to kick back with a captain's hat and a fine cigar and watch the Dennis and Andy show. These guys are huge nerds, but they're the kind that you actually want to hang out with. Enjoy them. I do. Oh yeah, what is up everybody? It is Wednesday. It is 5 p.m. That means it's time for the Dennis and Andy show. That, damn you. The gang signs are going to get us killed. I'm going to be walking on the street one day. Somebody's going to come, come up to me and go, I'm sick of seeing your buddy do those gang signs. Pop, pop, pop. And they're the going to take me out the only because they, they can't take, get to you. It's the Andorians. It's the only people that would take offense to the Vulcan live long and there's only center. one thing I like to see when I see this is this mork for mork. That's what you're gonna say. Nanu nanu that's, that's where I was going. That's where I knew you were going. That with is it. that's where I was going. I will say though, uh I always rock down to that intro. My daughter created it. I love the music. Speaking of music, I said last night the seventh time was the charm with the core draft video. I was wrong. It's the eighth time. Why? Because during the professionals, they were on there. We had a lot of chats. Andy got to show the video, our T-shirt design, and we took a lot of your comments were in there talking about, you guys really need metal music. You guys need the metal music. So we took it to heart, and we've been hard at work in the studio this afternoon putting together the new video and boy, I think we nailed it. So let's take a look at the new chord draft video that's a little more metal. Damn, I wish I had long hair and I could shake my head and it would go all around. So what do you guys think? If you like the new version, give us the thumbs up. Let you know. We listen to you. That's and right. I think it's better. So let's say hi to people. Richie Dupe, hello. Val's in the house. Very, very Slayer-like. That is true. Uh, Survive Infinity, hello. Uh, lots of people here. Sheldon Martin, welcome. Uh, Mr. Hunt, hi to you. I know what you're trying to do. Uh, Randy says, scissors action. Uh, no, Mork for Mork. Mork. Marcus is in the house. Adam Miller, hello. Lots of people in the house, but we have a guest. We have a guest, and we don't want to keep him waiting. You know, he got up early. He did. He He's got all the way from Australia, and I'm going to give shouts to Val Schnitzel, who's on our stream right now. One of our wrenches, he got me turned on to Michael Bancroft's channel, and I have been watching him ever since. So this is my first time actually meeting Michael in person, so let's bring him on. Let's do it. Well, hello. Hello. Uh, <laughs> are you ever sick Great of to... Americans saying the only thing we can say in Australian, which is, crikey, it's early over there. Crikey. 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 Crikey is the, uh, yeah, we, we love our uh, Steve-O, and he's the closest thing we have. Him and his, well, he's gone, but his family, they're the closest thing we have to uh, royalty down yeah. here. So, yeah, yeah. No, I like it. Crikey is good. We Do people bring actually crikey. say Crikey down no, there? No, he's the only one. He's the, that's oh. his, it's his catchphrase. <laughs> but uh, he, sh it was like, it was like Paul Hogan before him, you know, spreading around the word of the shrimp on the Barbie. It's like, he's the oh, only yeah. one who ever said it, but uh, yeah, you know. 
it's good. We 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 do not shy away from this uh, spreading the cultural love thing. Like I know so many others do. You want to you want to like just think of us as a uh, larrikin, funny, weird guys who live upside down land. That's that's good. Do it. So do you uh, do you like Outback Steakhouse? Never been. We don't have Outback Steakhouse. Unfortunately, you mean they're not I, everywhere down there. They're not everywhere. When I go to the states, I'm planning on coming next March um, for uh, MegaCon. Oh, I right. I hey. hope I can. I hope I can visit an Outback Steakhouse and finally eat a Bloomin' Onion. <laughs> well, now that yes. I, now that I know you're coming for MegaCon, I'll have to. We'll have to definitely see if we can get down there too. So. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Should be a yeah. Should we, be a we missed it this year. We we had another convention the exact same time. So hopefully next year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if we meet yeah. up, we will buy you that blooming onion. Oh yeah. Oh, we'll thank you. Tree, for that. And yeah. I will get you it a was... fosters to wash it down. I was just gonna say because oh. you call that a beer. What's all beer for Australian? Or what was it in knife? It was you call that a knife. Fosters, that's not a beer. This is the beer right here. I've even got the sign, Victoria Bitter, VB. That's what, that's what we drink. Well, that's what All I right. drink. Now, some Australians might disagree. It's a harsh drink. It's a it's a real man's man's beer. It's a working man's beer. So is it a dark beer? Is it an, what, what what kind is it? I, I'm a stout it's a draft. guy. So if you it's can see draft. through it, I don't like it. Uh, you can. Yes, it's, oh, it is. It it's the like amber time. nectar. It's the amber nectar. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not heavy. I don't. It's hot down here. We want to. We want something that you can slam <laughs> exactly. down in summer. You don't want to be drinking freaking ten W forty motor oil. That's gross in the heat, Dennis. I know you worry about your Shirley Temples. I'm good with mine. Oh, that's not true. <laughs> Real, I mean, every now and then they like you know. I like to kick back, just saying. So, well, very nice. Well, thank you for getting up so early. I, I actually checked with a with my Amazon digital assistant. I don't want to say mm-hmm. her name uh, to see what time it was down there before, uh, you, right before you came on. So, yeah. No, look, it's not too early. I like to get up early and draw, you know, before the kids wake up. So, yeah. um, I actually slept in this morning, but that's okay. Um, I'm here, ready, fresh. Let's do it. All right. All right. Is, last question about the area: Is it light out yet, or is it still yes. dark? It's light. It's light. We're, we're heading into we're heading into summer, so um, it's starting. Yeah, it's longer days, lighter oh, okay. out earlier, lighter later. Yeah. And we are leaving summer behind, mm. unfortunately. Yeah. Oh yeah. So one of the things we always like to do, especially since it's your first time on our channel is we Mm -hmm. like to find out and ask you about your origin story. How did you get into comic books? Like, what was your first comic book that you picked up as a kid? And how did you get into doing comics? That is so funny. I I Actually, I'm so used to telling this story. I usually have it um, on hand. I don't know if I do. I I mean, I had it here. I was talking about it uh, not too long ago which is such a shame but i usually actually have the the comic oh nice sitting That's nearby right. that i i pick i picked up off the newsstand i mean it's probably lying around here somewhere but i don't know where it is unfortunately it was a web of spider-man i think it was number 83 yeah. maybe can't really remember but uh yeah i just picked it up off the newsstand all my friends i, I was 11 or 12 all my friends were reading comics uh, so I thought, well, I better go in, uh, get in on this bandwagon. Remember that when all the kids were reading comics yeah. <laughs> and you just go down to the newsstand and pick one up and oh, that yeah. my, uh, we had what we call a news agency, which is like a big mm-hmm. shop, magazines, newspapers, books, comics at the time They had a massive section of comics. And, uh, you know, I just went, I picked up the one that a character I had heard of before Spider-Man, uh, and that looked coolest to me. And it was that book. And yeah, I was like, yeah, this is cool. I read through it. Like, this is, this is awesome. Back in those days, the paper was still um, newsprint. Uh, The colors were mostly just flats with very few, uh, very little kind of special effects or anything like that. Uh, And yeah, I didn't look back. I read mostly Spider-Man, a little bit of Ghost Rider. 
when Spawn came out, I picked that off, off the newsstand as so wait, well. Wait, was that Web of like, Spider-Man? Was that was that late eighties? Early nineties. So like early nineties. Okay. Yeah. So I kind of had missed McFarlane on Spider-Man. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I first learned about him on spawn and then went back and bought trades and everything and I, I ended up going back and buying almost the complete run of peter parker obviously all the run of web and yeah. a lot of amazing as well but there i read them until probably about 15 ish i think 16 i don't know up until the whole the floor fell out underneath yeah. marvel and uh but they were already skating on thin ice with me they were like forcing me to buy all these different comics that I didn't want to buy just to keep up with the stories. And right. that was, that was difficult for me because obviously I was just a kid and I was saving up. I was saving up. I was walking to school so I could save up bus money um, to buy these comics monthly. And uh, yeah, that was sort of the end of it, but uh, I kind of fell out of it and I was reading comics and I was collecting comics here and there, not very seriously. And um uh, eventually, many, many, many years later, you know, fast forward to me in my God, I think I was in late 20s or 30s. Um, I started, I, you know, my wife is French oh, and cool. I started finding these. These are uh, Bande dessinées, BD, oh, okay. uh, as they're called, French album comics. That's what I said. Uh, well, I think everything. Yeah, these, Everything in France, England, Italy, wherever, they're just called albums. They don't call them comics, you know? Exactly. It's exactly right. It's a completely different uh, approach. And I right. just became hooked. Uh, and I was actually writing a story at the time, which eventually would become The Lucent. And uh, I was like, for the first time, I was like, could I actually turn my story into a you know, an album like that, a graphic novel. And well, you know, the thing I like about the albums, oh, yeah. and that's what I, I, I kind of try to tell people over here with what we're doing, is it's kind of like what we're doing. We're putting something out basically once a year, and mm -hmm. it's, it's obviously a lot thicker than just the floppy that you get, you know, monthly. Uh, yep. It's better production quality and stuff. And generally, you work either you do the whole thing yourself or you might work with one other person, you yeah. know, and it really is that European model. And yeah. it's funny, we were talking on Ethan's show one Monday night and, you know, you always hear the thing of going, Oh, well, you know, Marvel DC comics over here, they're only like five bucks. You guys are selling them for 25. Well, besides the fact the page count is triple, if not more, and it's a nice square bound and production quality and stuff. The other thing I like to say is, well, yeah, and I can go to McDonald's and pay a dollar fifty for a hamburger, or I can go to a nice restaurant and pay fifteen twenty bucks for a hamburger. That's a hell of a lot better. Yeah, and that's, that's what we the thing. Are. That like that's the thing. We, I had Kelsey Shannon on a few months back, and we were just geeking out over this because he's he's a massive fan of the French books as well. Yeah, and I agree that now I'm not. I don't want to put down. Um, anyone who you know draws uh monthly comics or anything no, like that no, but it's just all. logistically logistically if you're spending a year or even longer making these i don't know 50 60 70 page books and like you can just see that like you, they're, they're doing things in these books that you just can't do on a with the time constraints that they that the companies will give you to put out a monthly floppy so yeah. i mean and i'm all for that that's i mean that's what i'm about like that's what I like. That's what pulled me back into this comic book world. And then when, then when I got there, um, you know, I found your boy, Zach, I found Ethan, I found everyone in comics gate and, sure. uh, you know, sort of been really back into it, uh, since, you know, that happened in kind of 2017. So yeah, it, it's funny. It's I've come back uh, full yeah. circle to what I was interested in when I was a kid, even though I had a big, uh, I don't know, 15 year hiatus in the middle of it. I was still reading the odd comic, like, but mostly just things I, I knew I could just pick up and read and I, you know, like star Wars stuff. Cause you know, you know, the characters and everything right. like that. But uh, um, yeah, I was mostly, I was mostly out of comics for uh, a very long time. So it's, it's great to be back. No, that's cool. You know, just real quick. Cause you mentioned star Wars. 
quick question star trek star wars which one i had this question we would ask this question the other day at the dinner table <laughs> i can't do it i can't do it i love oh, it oh yeah oh, i've absolutely. got i've got mr star trek here off camera sitting over here doing stuff is my daughter who is mrs star wars and i was waiting for you to pick one so i could either bust on him I or can't. her now i, I mean i was no. I was a monumental Star Wars fan growing up. My it was the first movie I was ever taken to as an infant in 1980. That's when Empire Strikes sure. Back hit the cinemas here in Australia. Um and I was yeah, my mother was a massive Star Wars fan. She took me there as a baby. I, I mean I grew, my first memories it was just like Star Wars everything. Star Wars clothes, we we would watch Star Wars religiously, all the toys and everything. I mean, it was a massive part of my life. I grew up, I, I read dozens and dozens of the extended universe books. But then in high school, a friend introduced me to this. And I've been hooked ever since. I, I love it. But it's it's just different. I mean, that's like saying, what do you like? Um, you know, two classic things. Just because they're set in space doesn't mean they have to, they have to go against each other. Oh, one is one is science fiction. The other is um, a fantasy set in space, and I think right. there's room enough for both. Well, Absolutely. I know. I know. And, and, you know, there's a lot more. There's Battlestar Galactica, Lost in Space. I mean, there's so many more. The Expanse. The Woo! Expanse. Orville. Babylon 5. I don't know if you watch the Orville, but the Orville is really good. I love the Orville. Yeah. Yep. This past I season think... was just great. Oh, yep. it's so good. I think I actually I need to make a video on the Orville. Um, I I really love that Seth MacFarlane must have tricked some studio head in saying, hey, we're making a Star Trek parody. And then literally three or four episodes in, you realize, oh, no, no, we're just, we're just making Star Trek that, you know, no one's making anymore. But with exactly. their own new characters. Well, yep. they um, actually were talking about it. It started out as Family Guy in Space, which is what everybody teased yep. about. But yep. they realized that they could put out such good stories that they started probably by third or fourth episode, they started pulling back on the comedy and started putting forward better science fiction. And it continued. And even this season, it was, they, they relegated the comedic factors to two characters and they were great, but they were just such solid sci-fi stories, very much like the original Star Trek was. Yeah, yeah. You you see at the end of an episode, and they're quite long episodes. Some of them are oh, even yeah. almost movie length. You just sit there like, uh, you know, you kind of been hit in the gut, and you're like, you're having some moral conundrum in your head, and you're thinking it through. And you was that was that right? Was that wrong? What are the ramifications of this? Is this something that we're going to have to deal with in the future if the technology advances? Well, I mean, this is star. This is science fiction. That's what it should be. So but then they exactly still touch right. on stuff that that is going on, you know, commentary about stuff today, like with yeah. Bordis and the kid, you yeah. know, yeah. and how you yeah, know I think that was baby. All, yeah, the that way was they just, did that was really brilliant. It was, it was, it, and they they carry it from season to season, so you you had to have at least watched it to to fully grasp it. But they they wrote them very well. The writing is just so incredibly well done on that show yeah the only thing i have to say bad about it is seth mcfarlane has a very weird face and <laughs> he does. he's on the camera i'm like i you know I, I they have actors for a reason i know he's a voice actor he's very he's very talented yeah but it's just like i don't know there's something about <laughs> something about well, his face i he's get not, past it. He's, he's and you know i'm not one to talk but it's not like he's leading man good yeah, looking yeah, yeah. but he's, he's not ugly or anything no he's not he ugly has, at all he just has an unusual he, face. right he has an unusual <laughs> face and i think part of it's like the hairline and stuff his eyes yeah. his but eyes you know, he had to go from because he was comedic in the first few and he's relegated himself now that he has to be the stern serious captain and the problem is yeah. we look at him as the comedic jokester all the time so it's very hard for us to put him into that role well, i saw a comment surgery. in the uh in the in the chat there someone asked if i if i uh used to draw comics i did i used to um 
I used to like copy uh, Mark uh, Bagley, Bagley or Bagley. I can't remember how to say his name. Yeah, actually, I, that was, all, that was like, another question we were going to get to his favorite artist, you know, growing up and stuff. Little Spider Man's. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was obsessed with um, Bagley's Spider Man. I thought he was really rad. Uh, you know, everyone, yeah. everyone loved Todd McFarlane. I've now that I'm a bit older, I uh, I'm more into um, sort of the more Bronze Age stuff. When I look back on comics, I, that stuff really, I'm in awe of what they were doing. Oh yeah, and, just, and the the visual language of it all. Um, so yeah, that's sort of. But I was I was at the time I remember yeah like I was just trying to like, I was just ripping off Jim Lee. Uh, trying to poorly. Uh, oh, this is go. my character that I made, the Silver Star. <laughs> nice. I still got this. When did I draw this? That's cool. It's probably like in '93 or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool, though. That, it's, yeah. great. it's great to have that stuff. I know. Um, I'm happy I kept it all. Bagley was the guy that won the uh, Marvel tryout book contest. So. Oh really? Yeah, that's oh, cool. You know that? Yeah, no. I didn't yeah. know that. I, I, uh, maybe I did back in the day, but, uh, um, yeah, that, no, I, I liked cool. how, yeah, he was like, he would draw this really ripped, skinny, muscular, uh, Spider Man. I thought that was, that was really, I don't know, it was really cool. Well, the funny thing about it is it, you know, it, it works because you just look at, you know, the current Spider Man, Tom Holland, that kid's shredded. But when he's wearing normal clothes, you have no idea, right? So mm. it totally works. Drawing like Bagley did that that totally shredded teenager, because when he's wearing normal clothes, you just be like, oh yeah, he's just a small teenager, you know. So it it, it really did work well. I mean, I've always liked Mark stuff as well. I didn't find out until he was in the business for a few years that he was the winner of that tryout book contest. So. Um. What, one, one of the uh, our guests are asking, who are your Bronze Age artists? Who do you like it from the Bronze Age? I'm I'm terrible with the names, and it's probably yeah. going to be just um, like Spider-Man artists. Um, who's the guy? He's like a legend. Um, there was Junior? a father. Yeah, Ramita. Like stuff yeah. like that. I just, that was that's my, my very earliest memories of Marvel Comics was that style mm -hmm. and you know it's just sort of like that thing it just it just hits it hits you right in the nostalgia and when i look back on the comics now that's the stuff that i prefer uh more than say the uh early 90s jim lee um sylvester sort of stuff which i can you know i can see i can oh, rationalize yeah. like that is awesome stuff and you know amazing work but like for me just personally i love more that and, and and when I when I went back and started collecting, my all time favorite, and I don't know if this is more Silver Age, but either way, my all time favorite era of comics was sort of like late seventies and into the eighties. Mm -hmm. um, like I thought that's when they got really cool. I think this is when they're they're at their coolest. So I I, I totally agree with you. That is my favorite. I'm an X Men guy, so I like Spider Man. Mm -hmm. I get Spider Man. I used to. Um, but X-Men has been mine. I've collected it. Well, I did collect them for 44 years until a few wow. months ago where I couldn't take it anymore. And I canceled all my Marvel and DC comics. I get nothing. It's all independent stuff now. But man, it, it broke my heart. But I look back at like the X-Men, even as a kid, I've been collecting them since the uh, mid uh, to slightly late 70s. And that really was the best stuff. That's what drew me in. And I yeah. love I love the '90s, but I'm telling you, late '70s, early '80s for me is my golden age. It's funny, isn't it, that people like, I, I came to that conclusion all on my own just by going back and reading back issues. Mm -hmm. A lot of people love that era as well. Uh, and there was just something, there was something in the air at that time, and it, the same thing was happening in movies and music. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I hope one day we can get back to something like that. I mean, I think we're trying to do it here in independent comics, but, you know, we'll see how we just don't have the reach that, right. uh, you know, was seen to be afforded to 
uh, you know, really creative new artists back in the eighties, but uh, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, no, I, you know, the first comics I bought were from 1983 and it was Captain America by Mike Zeck. And I still hold those in the highest regard. And that is just the Captain America for me. Like when Sal Buscema was drawing the Hulk in the eighties, mm -hmm. that, was, that yeah. was my, yeah. and, and I love, don't get me wrong. I love what John Byrne did. I love what Dale Keown did. But when I was growing up and Dale and I talked about this one day as well, and he was like, oh yeah. Sabu Summer was like my guy. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's and another I'm one. Like, yeah, he just, you know, there he had such a long run on the Hulk and he had such a nice visual to the character and stuff. So I totally Couldn't I agree. Hear you. Uh, what do we got here? What's Val saying? Andy and Dennis, did you hear about Michael's new concept? What is he talking COC creator I, I, owned I, comics. I just made an offhand comment. What is, you know, what happens on a live stream. I was talking to someone. I said, I was course. thinking out loud and I said, look, you've got independent comics. That's what people say. Like we're in indie comics right. and indie comics. It has lots of different, uh, it's got baggage that gets attached with it. When you yeah, say it, it has connotations it, that go with it exactly and it's like oh it's good for an indie book or it's an indie book da, 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 or something like that and also as well if you want to talk indies um i remember dan frager when the first time i met him he was telling me this horror story how he'd worked so hard on a book for image and you know it went out into the stores and people were raving about it and that was you know being talked about on the news sites and all that sort of stuff and he sold i don't, I don't know how many copies he sold and at the end of the day, when all after everything was cut down, he made like, I don't know, eighteen hundred bucks or something right. from the whole thing. And I was just like, that is tragic. Yeah, um, yeah. But you know, sure, okay. He he and his partner, whoever he was working with, owns the IP, but they don't own Image. They're not right. they're not in control of the distribution and everything like that. So just thought, like, when we say indies, it's such a broad range and it encompasses so many people doing so many different things so i just said how about we just call it creator owned as in you're owning everything uh, right. uh, like from the from the ip to the production to the distribution you're getting it straight out to customers yourself you're cutting out the middleman and i just said that offhand and and uh nefarious uh, global frequency in the chat said oh so you love creator owned comics right doc yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know what? It, it does. It has a nice ring to it. I mean, speaking of our time frame, back then it was when you had these off comics, it was they were underground comics. I mean, that's what it was. That was the yeah. underground mainstream stuff that you couldn't see in the stores. But, you know, that a bunch of us used to go out there and collect. But that also had a stigma to it because they thought it was dirty. And uh, indie, you're right. Uh, a lot of people, if you say indie comics, they're like, oh, low published stuff. That well, that, that's whoever what I was does. Say. You think indie, and a lot of people think, oh, low budget, you know, stuff like that. That's the first thing that comes to mind. I mean, when I went to the Hubert School, you know, Joe taught, taught us how to do everything, you know, pencil inking, lettering, coloring, the whole ball of wax, because he wanted you to get a job when you graduated and his mindset was, you know, if you get a job lettering, you work your way up or, you know, whatever. But it also went to, you know, if you start off, you know, drawing comics for a very small publisher an independent publisher that has a really low page rates or so small, you do that until you work your way up. And, you know, I remember telling him, yeah, I hear that, but I'm shooting for Marvel or DC when I graduate. That's, that is my blinders on. That's what I'm shooting for. Nothing against the indies, but I wanted to just work at Marvel or DC so I could move out and live on my own and do all that. And, you know, knock on wood, that happened. And I was able to do that in my senior year. But, you know, you're right. Indie definitely has this stigma to it that you kind of have to reshape as we move forward. But I think it's happening with what we're doing. I think you know. so. And Randy makes a good point. He says, image won me over to indies in the 90s. And when right. you were thinking of indies, that's when indies kind of became mainstream, in my opinion, is, you know, when you yeah. had image and then 
Dark Horse and Defiant, you know, when, when shooters started coming out. And so anyway, that's I think the launch of it and image had really had the staying power in that particular area. Yeah, and as well, uh, the way I was thinking is like uh, you're exactly right in that a lot a lot of the time now, some of the best art we're seeing coming from the indies and not the mainstream, which mm-hmm. is unusual. Uh, yeah. You wouldn't think it would be that way, but that's just the way it is these days. And there's sort of this, I don't know, there's kind of this war going on between the mainstream and the indies. Uh, like it's like it has to be that way. The mainstream is just what's popular, right? At the time. That's that's what mainstream means. It's not like it's that. It's not like and it's an institution and they own that title. And then over here, there's the indies. It's like if your indie comic becomes super popular, hello, Ninja Turtles, Walking Dead, right. uh, whatever it may be, Spawn, then you no longer are indie, even though you are independent. You are yeah, now right. mainstream, and right. it's, it's all very confusing. I was like, I was like, it's it's creator owned, baby. It can be, uh, it can be uh, a guy who's making like making his first ever comic, like me, um, you know, just by himself, or it can be a guy uh, who's uh, you know thirty year industry vet who's um, you know doing the best art of his life and making all this super highly produced stuff. It's everyone. It's, right. It encapsulates everyone. Yeah, it's that's kind of a nice it. thing. I really like that. I actually like that that whole concept. What Creator Economy? Yeah, I do. Yeah, well, your, I, I, your I, favorite I, shop, favorite place to eat is Five Guys. So you like Creator Comics, and you like Five Guys in your mouth. I get it, Dennis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Can we, can and I, I, I noticed how you said COC has has a, it has a ring to it. Yeah, it can. It can have. It could have a ring, yes. <laughs> what you do at home separate. From Everybody you. knows, no matter what I say, you're going to twist this from a rated PG-13 show to something slightly more nefarious. Hey, if this was PG-13, I'd be able to say fuck just once. Oh, I just yeah, did. Just once. Right, you get, you get the one time. Yep, pass. that's it. It's the one time. Ro- and there's no blood allowed, so when Dennis punches me, no blood will spurt. Don't out worry. Of most of that's at all when the camera's off. Don't worry. Yeah. No, most of it's internal Just, blue. So you Dennis, can't go, Dennis, go for the bread basket. Like low, keep it low under the t-shirt, and uh, that way nothing will show up on camera. There, right. there you go. The bruises exactly. will be hidden by our shirts. The hidden bruises. That's right. Let's talk about. Uh, let's talk about your path to the lucent. While we do that, we'll throw up your sign up page, which. For everybody, the link is in the description below, so you can sign up for the new one, the Lucent, and uh, tell us a little bit about the first one as well, and just the path that I guess you took to get to this. Oh, man. So I started having insane dreams when I was, I don't know, in my early 20s. I've always been big into lucid dreaming, Mm -hmm. and uh, I just, I don't know, it just sort of picked up, and around about that time, the Matrix came out. Okay. And, you know, it was all like you plug into this thing where you can do this crazy stuff. And it was just like a whirlwind in my head where I was having these crazy dreams. I was doing things like in the Matrix. And I just had this, I was just like, imagine you could do some of these things that we can do in our dreams in real life. I had that right. percolating in my mind for a long time. Uh, I, I always wanted to write a story. Um, and eventually I just thought, you know what, screw it. I'm not getting any younger. I'm going to write a story at this point. I wasn't even thinking about comics. Like I said, I was out of comics. I was doing other things. I just started writing a story and uh, I found out that was really hard. It took me a long time (laughs) just doing it over many, many years in my lunch break after work, before work, whatever. And, uh, and so eventually I was in France. Like I said, I found these albums, these French albums, Bande Dessinées, and the story, the story that I'd struggled with for so long, it just came into clear focus. And I was like, I imagine this was a graphic novel because a lot of what I was thinking, because I've always been an artist. I was doing like t-shirt designs and graphic okay. designs and paintings and stuff like that. I never thought I could do this. Um, but when I saw it, I was like, I think I have to try. I have to try. I have to learn how to do comic book art. That is an ongoing struggle. It continues to this day. Um, but yeah, that's how it, let me tell you, my friend, after doing it for 30 years, it is still an ongoing struggle. (laughs) 
<laughs> I, I believe I've been doing it for about five and it is, yeah. I mean, every, every page is a new challenge for me, but I love it. I, I look forward to it because it, it helps me become better and better with each page. But sure. let, me grab, uh, I, let me grab this super chat real quick from Randy. Yep, go for it. Thank you, Randy. Speaking of fan clubs for first man, we had the first maniacs for Cordrath. We will be the ax maniacs. I like it. I do. It's got a ring. It's got a ring to it, Randy. We can, we can definitely see about, I got to come up with something catchy. So uh, that could be it. So thank you for that. Uh, five bucks, Randy. Really appreciate it. Um, it's good. It's got enough. a good visual uh, idea to the axe maniacs, the axe maniac, axe maniac. And it, it has a nice yeah. sound to it. So, <laughs> so anyhow, so yeah, so yeah, dude, seriously, every day when I draw, it's it's you know, 30 yeah. years ago, I thought, oh, this will be easier than yeah, it's not. And I think the it's different, I, I think for the for the guys that I, I'm sure there's some, I, well, I'll probably all of us say that it's still tough and whatever, but there's probably some guys out there that are that just sit down and can jam it out and just don't think twice but i just i just can't do that i mean i have to yeah you know i just beat myself up uh, well as well did. as well as you as you get better what you what you used to think oh that looks really good you realize oh that's actually got a lot of issues with it now right. so like you're continuously looking back and going oh well i thought i had this down and now I look at it and like, no, that needs improvement. So it's it's like this bouncing thing that never ends. But uh, yeah, um, you know, the, the whole thing about it is though, I always started off as I just wanted to write this. I just wanted to tell this story. That was my whole and still remains to this day. That is my uh, driving, uh, whatever it is, impetus on this thing is I just, I have this story in me. It's my, I love this story. I'm so passionate about it. The characters in it are so real to me. And, uh, you know, I'll just do whatever it takes to, to, uh, to kind of get it out there. When I first decided I'm going to, uh, make a comic, I didn't know anything about the scene. Um, th th I didn't know if there's even an indie comic scene in Australia. I didn't really even look into it. I just saw, oh, there's all these, like people are putting up their comics onto webtoons and Sepastic and all this stuff. So yeah. oh, I guess I'll just do that. And I'll you know, be able to get some feedback. I did that for a couple of years. I actually ended up being pretty, I mean, I had a really fantastic experience with it. Um, I ended up getting like 25,000 subscribers to my comic. Uh, you know, I was having really good interaction. It was really good to sort of bounce what was working off people who were actually reading it. Yeah. Uh, but then Comicsgate came, came around and I was like, I think it's time for me to take the next step because making comics for people for likes and comments on the internet is fun it's sure. a lot of work you get no money for it there's some people out there who do get a lot of money from it but they're sort of making comics that i'm not interested in reading or making they're sort of like romance um comics the manga style that sort of stuff oh, i was right, never really right. interested in that but uh i so i thought all right comic skate is here I'm seeing these guys, uh, it seems like a great opportunity for first timers to come in and crowdfund. Um, let's see how that goes. And yeah, I launched the first book and it went so far above and beyond my expectations. Uh, you know, the day, the day I launched, my wife said to me, what do you think? I said, I will be happy when this is all said and done. If I have a hundred backers. Right. And, uh, you know, fast forward a year and a bit later, we had over a thousand nice. uh, people gave me feedback on the book. Um, some people didn't get it. They didn't like it, but a lot of people really did. And, you know, that is, that's the manner from heaven is people really interested by the intrigue and the mystery. It's a real, I've made the story sort of in the, in a mystery box style where I just drop the reader in. I don't tell them really, I don't explain how the world works, what the mystery is all about. They're just in there. It's a puzzle, which is confounding. A lot of people don't like that. I love that kind of storytelling. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, it, and now we're coming back with the, with the second volume, which is going to be, you know, it's a bigger book. It's 90 pages. My Ooh. art has improved a lot. Um, and there's just going to be so much more meat on the bone for people to, uh, sink their teeth into 90 pages what was your first one uh 60 or 70 i think okay uh, yeah the, the, 
they're massive books. I don't know why I do it. I'm just like, <laughs> I, I think look. That, well, I think we, I think, <clears throat> excuse me. I think the reason we do the page counts we do is, you know, for the reader, you know, we want to give yeah. them this really good, satisfied, yeah. satisfying story to read knowing exactly that it. like albums, it'll probably be close to a year before another one comes out. And I think, yeah. I think that when people get used to, like when you tell somebody, you know, hey, this book comes out every month, you know, Spider-Man, you can get it every month. They get that in their mindset. And that's why when an issue is three or four weeks late, they're annoyed because it's like, hey, you told me it was every month. But what mm -hmm. we do is we say, look, it's going to probably be once a year. And if somebody knows what to expect and when to expect it, they're fine with it. You know, and the thing is, instead of just having something that's a continuous, all right, uh, we know I'll read it, cliffhanger next month, read it, cliffhanger next month. This, we we have a story to tell. Like you were saying, we've got a story. We, we want to go from A to Z, and we want the reader to see all of this in a self-contained unit. Get that one out there, and then next year, we're going to have another story to tell, but we want it to be complete. So maybe it'll be 60 pages to tell the story. Maybe it'll be 70 or 80. We're not limited to 32 or 28 and we can use whatever kind of like Orville. They're not limited to running 46 minute shows. They can do an hour and 18 minutes to tell the story if they need to, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just a yeah. better, nicer format to complete an idea. And that's probably that. That was one of the biggest uh, criticisms, which is completely valid from the first book, Waking Dr Waking Dream. Because I have, uh, being that this is uh, you know written in the mystery box style, I have mm -hmm. to. You have to have the whole thing planned out because I'm dropping right. hints and clues um, along the way. So I've got the whole thing written out. It's all it's all there. But the first book, it kind of did end on a sort of a semi cliffhanger. It wasn't a, a complete story, which that annoyed people. And I completely understand that. So that's why in this one, I'm like, all right, I need to make it a little bit longer because I want to give the readers that more satisfying conclusion. So even though it is an ongoing story in, in Painted Death, uh, essentially, you know, the readers will we'll get to see the the main character she's now fully ensconced in this world she's she's in this strange crazy world of the lucent and you know she has to make some choices how far does she want to go how far can she go is like and what will be the consequences of her decisions and we get to see all of that and then that's like all in one book and then you know hopefully the reader at that point they feel satisfied that they've gotten a, a completed story and now they want to continue on and see what happens next. So well, that's, that's just why like, I'm going this like 90 page behemoth. And that's, you know, that's what you can do is I think, I don't think it's bad to have little plot things that'll flow over to the next volume of a book. But I think mm -hmm. the overarching thing should probably wrap up, you know, yeah. it's just like, it's honestly, it's like novels got, you know, James Patterson yes. puts out, well, he used to, he put out like a novel a year with his main character, you know, but that, while that main, and he does true crime stuff or not true crime, but crime stuff. So while the main mystery would be solved, there'd still be these little plot things that he'd probably pick up in the next, next book, yeah. you know? So, so yeah, you're satisfied like and you're, and you're, you're, you're tied it over until that next volume comes out. In in uh, in in this book, in Painted Death, Ella, the main character, will have a run in with the main villain of the book. Um, and yeah, you, so it, it won't be the the big final battle between these two, where you know the villain is defeated, and you know it's like it's an ongoing. The the the, the there's a conflict. Um, there's consequences of those conflict. And then the story will continue in in the later volumes until the you know until the ultimate uh, confrontation and, and climax in the in the in the sixth book. Right. Randy has a question for you. He says, "Can we still get the original cover for Volume One of the Lucent when we order Volume Two? Uh, excellent question, Randy. Let me actually stop sharing that and let me share um, this here. Okay. Which is, I definitely want to see uh, the video as well. 
So yeah, I will go back and play the video, okay. but uh, I have about 15 of these left Randy. So it all depends okay. on how quickly these sell out and you know, how long it takes me to launch this thing. So um, I won't be reprinting this cover once they're sold out. There's about 15 left. That's it. They're done. Um, I will be, I will be printing a, um, a sec, uh, like a reprint for, for the second campaign with an all new cover. And okay. that's, yeah, that's what I'll be doing. But there's still about, there's still about 15 or so of these left. They're available. You can go to cgnow.net. That will take you, this link will take you through to my eBay store, uh, where I sell these things. Cool. So, um, yeah, it, it, it depends if I have any left. Yes, it'll be on there. If not, I mean, if you really, if you really want this cover, and I think it's a, um, you know, it's got the, uh, I've got it here. It's got the, um, the UV spot. Oh, over yeah, the puddle. yeah, yeah. So that's the whole concept of it. She's like, is she falling? Is she flying? What's happening? She's coming. Are you looking into a mirror or like? Yeah. It's all. If you've read the Lucent, you know it's all about like what is happening, <laughs> sort of thing, and that's reflected in the cover there. That's so cool. so outside the that cover, I'm assuming you have a different cover, like a second printing that you're gonna offer um yes. in conjunction with it. Okay. Yes, yeah. So that's uh that's what I will be working on um pretty soon, actually, uh, because you know it's it, it's time to start uh, sharing them out. So I've got to do I've still got to do the cover of the main of painted death and then um the the new cover of waking dream. Okay, cool, nice. Let's uh let's pull this back up and let's watch the video. All right, let's go. click it. You speak as though I have conquered death. I live death every day. I am surrounded. Smothered by it. Look at you now. He would have everlasting life. You seek to defy death. Yet you cannot even defy sleep. And how alike sleep is to death. It is a painted death. Nice. I, I love that trailer. Did you put that <laughs> it's a tease. Did you have somebody do it? What's that? Did you put that together yourself? I or? put it together, the whole thing. Yeah, I, I did that. It is a painted death. Wait a second. <laughs> I, I, I was going to ask if that was your voiceover. It was me, yeah. I mean, Dude, I, just, you, I, I gotta be honest. I was, <laughs> I, I was going to ask who did the voiceover because you pulled that off great. From the standpoint of, I have no idea. I whispered now, into the, the mic, well? and then yeah. Oh man, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Like when I started, I mean, you, I, you got no money. You got no one. Obviously, you know, no one knows you. No one's interested in your book. I mean, you just start from right nothing and yeah so i had to I, i'm still teaching myself how to draw these things i'm still teaching myself how to color um you know format uh, all that sort of stuff right i've got an editor thank god uh my yeah. goodness uh, I, I need an editor um and yeah you know put it all together and i've you know, taught myself how to do a bit of uh um you know adobe animate and premiere pro and audacity to do the things i downloaded cinematic sound effects and music it was a great package cost me like 30 dollars. it's got all of this stuff in there and yeah. i just made i just made this trailer and like it was exactly what i wanted it to be this is the teaser trailer it deals yeah. with the um the sort of historical side of it that's the the thing about this book is it's incredibly difficult for me to pitch because i cannot tell you what genre it is right. uh camel moon uh, my very good friend he's he says the the lucent is imagine the matrix had a baby with the da vinci code and i was like <laughs> yes yes that's it is you got these people who were doing these weird powers 
and it's kind of like you're being you're tapping into some thing that is uh mysterious and everything like that but at the same time you've got this other story that's that's unfolding at the same time which is well imagine if this had existed for thousands of years people had access to these powers and there's some there's immortality mixed in there somehow what world would they build and 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 what uh what sort of secret societies would come about out of that and like all this is sort of hidden in plain sight it's just underground underneath the surface and how would that play out through history this is this is all and you know you remember in the da vinci code it was like yeah. they've kept they've kept the truth a secret for thousands of years what the real what the real story of the holy grail is it's 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 a lot it's it actually functions a lot like that like what's the real truth of our civilizations here and how they were built and how they came about and uh that's all intertwined with the whole thing and the whole fun of the story the the, the fun side of it i mean i wouldn't call the loosen a really super fun story it's it is very i play it very straight it's like you know it, it is a thriller it's a mystery sure. um but the fun of it in me what why i get so excited about it is is you know pe giving the the pieces of the puzzle out and that mystery sure. and that and then the readers come back to me with their theories and that is like that's the best and when they get it right i'm like yes you know i've done my job somehow they've pieced together these two things that didn't seem like they were connected and they've figured something out and i love it that's uh, i that's think that's one of the fun things behind it is as mm. as you being the creator is you know you are weaving this tale and you want them to piece it together. So when they do, it's like you said, you're validated. You're like, yes. And you yeah. don't want to make it too easy. But then at the same exactly. time, it might take somebody two or three reads, which is actually yeah. really cool because it's almost more bang for your buck than just a straight, you know, A to Z type story. You know what I mean? Yeah. If, if you, you read it and you, you don't get all those breadcrumbs, you're like, ah, I got to read it again. A lot of people did read it very sort of superficially. Okay, what's happening in the story? And you read it, and they're like, "Ah, oh, look, it's okay. Uh, I didn't really, not really for me." Um, some people though want to read it again and again, and they start looking at the symbology I've put in there, the sort of um, the references to mythology and and the little visual clues and stuff, and then they start thinking, "Oh, there's really something going on here under the surface. Actually, there's multiple layers of it. What is the what is what are the characters saying?" What are they foreshadowing? That sort of stuff. And and then, yeah, once you read Painted Death, you'll be able to go back and read Waking Dream and so much of it that you just maybe thought were offhand comics, uh, comments or didn't really have much significance. You realize, oh, he was trying to tell us something there with that. Right. And uh, that I love. I love it when authors do that, always have. And so that's what I'm really trying to go with with this story um and yeah that's why it's that's why it's absolutely essential for me to have an editor because joe my editor he's the one who's like um i know you like subtle but this is beyond subtle this is like <laughs> no one will ever find this in you know you could have this book out for 100 years no one will ever find it or he'd be like he'd be like this is too obvious let's pull that back a bit and make it a bit right. more mysterious and you i just i need that because I'm too close to the story. I can't see the forest for the trees. He's sort of standing back. He can see the whole thing outside of the creator's eye. And uh, yeah. Um, no, that's it. that makes total sense. I mean, it's good to have that, that other set of eyes on it that can be objective and stuff to mm -hmm. look at it and give you those notes. Um, I think it looks really cool, man. I, I, I wish you the best. When are you launching it? Like how long have you had the sign up of? man a long time i wish i could answer that now here's the thing i'm in a sort of what what how can i say this like my channel is growing uh -huh. uh, i'm getting lots of signups and everything i am really excited for the future of cool. being a, a a comic book creator in this space but yeah. at the same time I'm still very much, uh, I have a full-time job. I work nine to five. I'm doing this before I go to work, after I come back from work. I do my live streams in my lunch break. I still have a foot, well, maybe a foot and a half, well and truly placed still in the real world. 
Right. Uh, so I the, the 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 reason I say this is I just I never know day to day how much time I'll have to sure. work on this, which makes it incredibly incredibly difficult for me to schedule anything. Dude, and, I you know uh, I gotta that is that's that's very commendable that you're pulling down the nine to five. You're doing the work early, and then when you get home, I didn't know when you did. You know, I've been on your show a few times, of course. And, uh, I, you know, it's 11 p.m. my time. So knowing that it's on your lunch break, I'm like, oh, crap, that's awesome. It's the only way to do it. Like I saw, I saw what, you know, I listened to what John said back in 2018. He was like, you know, you got to get out there, build up your own audience. Right. Um, You know, I suggest that you're doing exactly the same thing here on your channel. Everyone needs to do it. We can't, we can't rely on someone else for the success of our careers. We have to be responsible for ourselves and go out there and get it. Uh, But uh, yeah, like I wish I could tell you. The thing is, um, I want to have a a really the lion's share of the work done before I go live because of that. Last time I did overshoot my projected shipping date by a couple of months. There were some printer issues, sure, but... It really came down to me, like 90% of it was me just not really knowing how much work it goes into actually making a printed comic book. Sure, uh, it, sure. It's it's an insane amount of work. And uh, especially what, if you've got like, you're working with an editor and there's like, that doesn't look good. You need to fix that or that, you know, we need to rewrite this part, that sort of stuff. Uh, so um, yeah, like I wish I could tell you, and I want to, and I want to really like hype it up. I want to really... Oh, yeah hype up the launch give it a good month or so beforehand of i'm gonna you know go out onto a bunch just like do this go on a bunch of different streams and really hype it up but uh watch this space and i i'm i'm cognizant that it is taking a long time for me to launch this so that's why i'm doing a lot of draw streams where you can come and actually watch me work on this stuff whether it's colors flats drawing whatever um on my channel so that's cool no, dude, that's really cool. I think it's going to do really well. Um, before we go, uh, what what does Michael like to do for fun? Not when he's working and stuff down there. What do you do, man? F- fun? What? Uh, <laughs> man, I used to be into so many things. This comic stuff has really taken over my life. Let me tell you what I love, what some of my passions were. Were I not so focused on comics, um, I am an avid poker player. I used to play professionally for a couple of years, Um, but I I decided to give that up uh, to pursue comics. Uh, Look, I'm I'm a family man. I'm just happy with uh, the wife and kids. You know, one of the funnest things we did a month ago is um, we had a movie night here in just in the house where the kids got like mattresses out in the living room and we watched a movie together and we had popcorn and everything i'm like i don't i don't need anything else than that i'm like no I'm that's cool go out and do anything else so yeah that's that's my life but i i, I love having fun on youtube as well like i look sure. forward to that I, I, camels here we play video games on on youtube and um yeah you know i enjoy comic skate <laughs> he enjoys counting does I say taxes, taxes with me and my coach? Yeah, that's what, <laughs> that's what Camel calls his super chats and memberships, his taxes, his collecting uh, taxes. Uh, <laughs> well, I hope that, since Camel's watching, uh, I'd like to come on your channel, uh, Mr. Camel Moon, sometime. So uh, throw that out. And, of course, Michael, once we launch Cordrath, I'd love to come back on yours as well. Oh, absolutely. So. Yeah, no, it's it looks uh, it looks really good. This is a very ex- going to be an exciting month, September and October. Yeah. Out of October. And lots of good so stuff. So, man, you it. used to play. So, you know, like, I'm awful at poker. So, you like mm-hmm. know, like, all the different types of games and stuff, or are you just like specifically? Um, oh, look, I'm mostly, you know, the standard uh, Hold'em. I've had played a little bit of uh, PLO. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, no, look, um, yeah, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, pretty good at it. <laughs> playing tournaments nice. and cash games and stuff like that i made a lot of money uh but uh, at the end of the day sometimes you just if you have if you want to be creative and you want to make something you can't ignore that instinct right. sure and i played i played poker for two years and at the end of it i was like i haven't made anything i haven't 
built anything. There's nothing to show. I have nothing to show for two years other than I made money. And I just, that, well, I wasn't about that life. Uh, so, right. Yeah. Well, I hear you. Camel Moon. Thank you, brother. Yeah, we can definitely, uh, the only time we've been together is in the wrestling ring. Uh, <laughs> Who won? Well, it was a four, it was, it was myself, Camel, Cecil, and uh, I haven't watched it in a long time. Well, actually, hold on here. Uh, I can, I can tell you in a second. Uh, let's see. Let's watch this. Oh, look at that. <laughs> there you go. I love that show. I, I know, I dude. So do I. And I was watching it. So good. That's Even though great. I lost. I know. That's fun stuff. Hey, man, hang back. We're going to close out the show. I was going to say we got a couple, a little bit of a few things to cover. Oh, Make yeah. sure you guys, uh, we're talking about building audiences. So some of you guys are new. Some of you are watching it on Andy's channel, which is the Andy Smith comic artist. So make sure you subscribe to his. My channel is the DNA, uh, Dennis and Andy show. So you can uh, follow us on there. I just put the link down there. Um, I do quick flips like uh, YouTube shorts on the new videos. We do full reviews. I just did a full, I just put together the Starship Enterprise Playmobil, 40 inches, fully electronic ship. Took me three hours. 150 pieces. It was fantastic. We put lots of that stuff up there, not to mention all the great comic stuff that we do. So make sure you subscribe to both of our channels so you get all of our information on Core Draft, The Reckoning. That's right. And sign up. The link is pinned to the top. Everybody that signs up and backs it will get this limited edition Little Enough trading card. Only if you sign up and back it will you get this. So do that. Of course, there's the cover. And uh, we will be rocking a, a nice metal-looking T-shirt. So uh, that'll be part of the campaign as well. That looks sure. rad. That's good. Oh, yeah. And I forgot. Yeah, show them the Bud cover. And, of course, we've got our pal, our friend in town, Bud Root, did a nice cover for us, Whew. colored by Dan Lawless. So that'll be a variant cover on the campaign as well by Mr. And the Bud man. Root. Very it's a hot cool. piece, isn't it? Yeah. Keep sexy, sexy pants. ladies. Keep it, in your, keep it in your pants, Dennis. Good Lord. Hey, it's good fantasy art. What can I say? It is good fantasy art. All right, guys. Until next time, let's see. What do we want to end with? Uh, let's see. Where's that good? We'll end with this. All right. We'll see you guys next Wednesday. We'll have a guest. We'll figure it out later. Michael, hang back. Take care, everybody. Oh, two game yeah! signs. Yeah. Woo! Damn it.